Okay, thank you, thank you. I really, really am delighted to be here with you tonight, uh, to have the opportunity to talk with you about making high-stakes decisions. We make decisions all the time, including really difficult decisions like what color shirt I was going to wear tonight. <laughs> that decision is not going to change the world, fortunately. However, many of our decisions will. Artificial intelligence. If there's anyone who doesn't hear about AI constantly now, I'm truly jealous of you. <laughs> I mean, AI may be the most profound technology in the history of humanity, capable of creating tremendous new opportunities for us. At the same time, some AI research may be so dangerous to humanity that it should be paused immediately until the risks can be better understood. Here's another example. So scientists are studying ways to engineer the atmosphere to reflect a little bit more sunlight. This could offset some of the effects of global warming and prevent some of the most devastating consequences of climate change. But the idea that we're going to go into the atmosphere and make a new change that just precisely offsets the changes that we've already made in a, system, in a system that's as complex as the climate, I mean, you can understand how some people see that as a nightmare. And here's a third example, genetically modified mosquitoes. So research suggests that releasing certain kinds of genetically modified mosquitoes may be able to prevent the spread of deadly diseases like malaria. However, genetically engineering wild populations of mosquitoes raises concerns about unintended consequences in the ecosystem. Okay, so each of these technologies has world-changing potential, right? Potential benefits, but also potential risks. So what do we do? Of course we want to be careful. We want to avoid using these technologies in ways that cause harm, especially if that harm is difficult to undo. But there's also a cost to being overly cautious, right? The effects of climate change are here. They're getting worse. And every minute, a child dies due to malaria. So there's real harm in not using technologies if they have an opportunity to help. All right. So how can we make decisions about these technologies that balance the potential benefits and the potential risks? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So I work on the third example, on genetically modified mosquitoes. I lead an initiative called the Gene Convene Global Collaborative. It's a nonprofit initiative with a mission to support informed decision-making about this technology. I'm going to share the lessons that we've learned from our efforts, which I believe are important for decisions about other kinds of world-changing technologies. And to do that, first I want to tell you a little bit more about malaria. So malaria is a devastating disease. It's caused when a parasite infects our red blood cells and replicates. It causes a fever, and if it's untreated, leads to more serious symptoms and can eventually lead to death. A child dies from it every minute. Malaria has been killing humans for hundreds of thousands of years. And only recently, a little more than 100 years ago, did we learn how the parasite gets into us. And that is through the bite of a mosquito. So, yeah, who here has been bitten by a mosquito? Or is it? All right, yes. Everyone's, everyone's hand goes up. Um, hopefully, when you were bitten, you were lucky enough that the mosquito that bit you wasn't carrying any diseases. Unfortunately... For over 200 million people every year, they aren't so lucky. The mosquito that bites them previously bit somebody who had malaria, and it carried the parasite to them, and they got malaria too. So once we understood the malaria is passed between people through the bites of mosquitoes, then we could begin to understand ways to stop its spread. 
So one of the most important ways is to reduce the number of the mosquitoes that are transmitting malaria by getting rid of their breeding sites or by killing them with pesticides. We can also protect people from mosquito bites more directly, for example, by sleeping under a bed net that's been treated with pesticides. We can treat people with malaria, try to clear the malaria parasite out of their blood before they get bitten by a mosquito again. And we can vaccinate so that even if someone does get bitten by an infected mosquito, they won't get malaria. So these tools that we have to stop the spread of malaria, and very importantly, the resources to make them available to the people who need them, have actually helped us make really impressive progress against malaria. So this chart shows annual malaria deaths. And you can see that for about 15 years, from the year 2000 to the year 2015, there was actually a pretty impressive reduction in malaria deaths. Unfortunately, progress has really stagnated over the last several years as we reach the limits of what we could accomplish with the tools we have and the resources that we had. And that was before the COVID pandemic really disrupted malaria control in 2020. So when you consider this context, there's a lot of interest in developing new approaches to prevent the spread of malaria particularly approaches that could have a big impact and still be affordable. And one of those approaches is the genetic modification of mosquitoes. Scientists have genetically modified mosquitoes in ways that can either reduce the number of mosquitoes or prevent the malaria parasite from passing through them. And both of these approaches have been successfully demonstrated in laboratories. But there's a big challenge to get from there to actually protecting people from malaria. Only about five species of mosquitoes are responsible for most malaria transmission. But there are still billions of those mosquitoes out there, right? And there's no possible way to go out and collect all those mosquitoes, bring them into a lab, genetically modify them, and release them again, right? So how can we use these genetic modifications to protect people from malaria? And the answer comes from nature, from something called gene drive, which we see in lots of different organisms, including corn, fruit flies, mice. And what gene drive is, is when some of the genes in an organism are passed on to its offspring more than they usually would be. So if, for example, this blue mosquito has a gene drive, and it mates with a mosquito and has offspring, then those offspring will carry the gene drive, and they'll mate, and their offspring will carry the gene drive. And this will continue until all the mosquitoes in the population are carrying the gene drive, and very importantly, any other genetic modification it's carrying along with it, such as the modifications that could prevent the spread of malaria. So gene drive is the answer to the question of how we could use these genetic modifications to actually protect people from malaria. And in fact, these approaches have been demonstrated to work successfully in cages of mosquitoes. So now there's a really important question. Should we take those mosquitoes and release them into the environment and see if they work there to protect people from malaria? Turns out that's actually not a straightforward question to answer for a few reasons about the technology. The first one is the potential scale of the impact. So gene drive is designed to spread through populations of mosquitoes. So releasing a gene drive has implications for communities and countries beyond the location where it's released. For the mosquitoes that transmit malaria in Africa, theoretically, it's possible that a gene drive could spread across most of the continent. The second reason is persistence. So gene drive is designed to stay in the populations of the mosquitoes for years to protect people against malaria. And if the gene drive spreads successfully, it may be difficult to reverse those modifications in the future. The third factor is novelty. So gene drive mosquitoes have never been used in the environment. Some similar approaches have been used to control other insect pests, but the combination of factors in gene drive is new. So when we're making a decision about something for the first time, we can't look at what happened the last time we did it to help inform what we do here. Okay, so I've been talking about genetically modified mosquitoes and malaria, 
But you look at these factors, scale, persistence, and novelty. Think back to decisions about AI, decisions about geoengineering the climate. Those share these same factors, right? There's another challenge to making decisions about these kinds of technologies that's common to world-changing technologies and definitely applies to genetically modified mosquitoes from malaria. And that's that there are often strongly opposing perspectives in society about the best way to move forward. For example, there are people who believe the risks of genetically modifying mosquitoes are so great that there should be no further research in this area. And there are other people who believe that the potential of the impact on malaria is so important that we should move forward with this, with this technology as quickly as we can. Okay, so in summary, we're talking about a decision that would affect large populations without the ability of individuals or communities to opt out, that would be difficult to reverse, and that we haven't made before. And moreover, where people have highly polarized perspectives on what the best way forward is. So, I mean, given that context, it's a reasonable question. You know, is there any way that we can plausibly move forward with decisions that lead to good outcomes? And I think the very good news is that the answer is yes. There is an approach that is being used to make decisions about genetically modified mosquitoes for malaria. It's an approach that has been developed over decades to make decisions where there's a lot of uncertainty about risk. It's been applied to other world-changing technologies, and it's part of the UN Treaty for making decisions on genetically modified organisms. And when you look at it, I think you'll see elements of it that you apply when you make high-stakes decisions in your own life. So the first element is to identify the risks. So to start with the decision, and then broadly ask, what are the possible outcomes that people are concerned about? And then for each of those potential risks, you can start with the decision and map the chain of events that leads from the decision to that potential undesirable outcome. The second element is assessing the risks. So we can't truly know the likelihood of any of the risks without making the decision. But what we can do is look at that chain of events and often test parts of it. And for example, if one part of the chain of events is incredibly unlikely, then it means that that entire chain of events is incredibly unlikely. And then once the risks have been identified and they've been assessed, we can plan for them. There's a couple of ways we can do that. So one is, we can look back at the decision that we're considering and ask, is there a way that we can refine this decision that maybe could reduce some of the risks that we've identified without reducing the potential benefits? The other thing we can do now is we know what to watch for. We can plan to manage and potentially mitigate undesirable consequences that could be associated with the decision. The fourth element is communication. So this is absolutely the most important element to achieving informed decisions, and is essential to all the other steps in this approach. Right? For example, we need to broadly consult and gather input to identify the potential risks and to assess them, and then transparently communicate the risk assessments and the risk management plans. It's also a way of connecting the different parts of the approach. For example, when a risk assessment is communicated, maybe somebody looking at that identifies a new risk that we need to go back and include. And the last element is the decision itself. And usually there isn't just one decision. In the case of genetically modified mosquitoes, there are decisions by national governments, by communities, by researchers. Each of those decision makers has their own mandate, has their own process for making decisions, but all of them benefit from an informed and rigorous perspective on the potential risks. Okay, so this approach only matters if it can actually be applied in practice. So I want to give a quick example of its use. So the African Union Development Agency, starting eight years ago, began consultations across four regions of Africa, bringing people together to talk about the potential use of gene drive to control malaria and asking them what their concerns were. In those consultations, people identified the potential for risks to human health, the potential for risks to biodiversity, 
And the third most common risk they identified was to water quality. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in water, their larvae live there. So the question is, could genetic modification of these mosquitoes pose some risk to the water that they live in? This risk had been identified before, but it wasn't something that much uh, attention had been paid to yet. And as a consequence of these consultations, we were able to support some research looking at the potential risks to water quality from the use of gene-drive mosquitoes. Okay, so why is that important? I mean, for one, now anytime we're doing a risk assessment of gene-drive mosquitoes, we can include considerations of the risk to water quality because we know that's important to people. And the second is, as we're assessing those risks, now we have some additional research to help inform. Okay, so I have mostly been talking about genetically modified mosquitoes and malaria, but that approach is a general one. So as we consider and as you hear about new innovations, new technologies that have the potential to change the world, changes that can be exciting and changes that can be scary, I hope you'll remember back to this approach and believe that there are ways to make these decisions. And in particular, as we confront high stakes decisions about world changing technologies, the ones we have in front of us now, and ones we can't imagine yet, I hope you'll be an advocate for informed, rigorous, and just decision making. Thank you.